Yeah, so uh, so this is like the start of the um, the first main part of the book, um, and it's the, the whole of part two. Kind of you're you're building up from how to use these things to um, looking at how other R packages are written such that they can wrap these two um wrap a, a javascript visualization library and then you're building more and more complicated examples yourself as you uh, go through the chapters and then there's um um yeah there's a, a couple a couple other things towards the end of the the part two that look really complicated to me um uh i um I posted a, a thing because, I mean, even though it's quite a short chapter, there was a little bit towards the end of it that I'd never considered before, really, about how you ensure that um, the visualizations, if, if you've got multiple visualizations in the report, how you can kind of ensure that they access the same data. And, and, which seemed quite neat, which hopefully you'll touch upon. Um, yeah, so there's a couple, uh, so that's been a couple of minutes. We might as well get started if that's okay with you, uh, Ryan. So this is um, chapter three of JavaScript for R. Um, and for those watching on YouTube, this is a book club that we run as part of the R for Data Science Slack community uh, to learn, um, kind of novel technology that is allied to the R programming language. And this particular book by John Cohen is kind of how to um, interface with JavaScript in the various forms that you'd use JavaScript from R. Um, the, the section of the book that we're starting on today is about how you would use data visualization libraries that are written in JavaScript as an R programmer um, and how you might, you know, use them within a R markdown report or something like that. So it's you're sending data out to the visualization library for it to represent in the browser. Um, uh, yes, you've all been here before. So yeah, you should know that uh, whatever you do or say will be recorded for YouTube uh, for the next hour. Um, but I'll leave it over to, to Ryan to lead us through chapter three. Okay. Outstanding, thank you, Russ. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and ensure that everyone can see that okay. I'm using Chrome, so uh, if I need to increase sizes or anything, uh, I can do that too. Uh, this is gonna be chapter three. Uh, this is introduction to widgets. <clears throat> now, the word widget is kind of a misnomer. It, widget just means anything, right? It, uh, it's, it's just a placeholder for most uh, languages. Um, but the case that we have here, HTML widgets are these uh, various library types that are able to extend, as Russ had mentioned, able to extend uh, our visualization uh, from the RStudio environment or our environment into other frameworks like HTML and web-based output. So our learning objectives for this chapter three is reviewing alternative packages for interaction between JavaScript and R. Uh, dive into the use of Plotly for graphics. Uh, Plotly is a particular package. Um, we'll find here in a second that it's used in other languages as well. Uh, expand on using data table for data tables or DT uh, for data tables. Um, and then understand what is crosstalk and how to deploy it in a shiny app. Now, crosstalk is actually a really awesome subject um, and it's, it's still in its development path, um, hopefully. Um, as the author had mentioned, that this is uh, maybe possibly future-proofing um, the, uh, the intent of some releases coming up. Um, crosstalk is great. All right. The first thing I wanted to mention is uh, HTML widgets. Uh, they can be used for uh, R console for data analysis, uh, just like any conventional R plots. Uh, we can embed them 
in our markdown documents, and that's what I'm doing here with this particular presentation. We can incorporate it into a shiny web application. Uh, that's there's so many different facets of that subject um, that I don't want to uh, give them all um, complete focus. Uh, I'll be here quite a while if I have to talk about all of that. But the the most uh, important one and my favorite is that you can actually save some of these HTML widgets uh, or output them into an HTML page that can be a standalone. You don't need a server. You can send that HTML file to somebody else uh, and all the uh, next user would have to do is open it open it in their browser, the document object model takes over, and there you have it. Now you've got this interactive web page um, with awesomeness, and it's just one single text file. Okay. There are currently 127 registered widgets on the gallery at htmlwidgets.org, and I want to open that real quick just to kind of give a person some visualization of what we're dealing with here. So when we use the word registered, I'm implying that it's been uploaded or posted to this page and made it freely available to all other users uh, into the future should you want to try these out. Um, do not confuse this with like D3JS. That's going to be a different subject. Um, don't, conf don't confuse D3JS and RStudio. Uh, they are two completely different applications, but I do want to at least note the fact that we are on this topic of visualization. So. Um, just ways that we can access and visualize details. Okay. Now I'm going to keep this page open for a second, but later in this uh, discussion or later in this presentation, I'm going to make reference to the fact that not all of these registered HTML widgets are available for crosstalk. So we'll talk about that in just a brief moment. Uh, going back to our slide deck here. Okay. So the first package that the author highlights in respect to HTML widgets and to this JavaScript library example would be Plotly. Now, okay, let me, I, I tried to do my best to convey our first initial touch point for a new user of our studio. And where I'm going with this subject is in most cases, uh, you will find on any recommendations, everyone points towards the R4DS uh, book by Dr. Wickham. Uh, it is our first initial uh, inclusion into the RStudio environment. Um, and chapter three specifically is data visualization. Now, in that first example of code snippet, the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The person that's not as familiar as a, as a uh, junior slash senior developer. Um, you're gonna see this code snippet. This is library ggplot2. Well, GG stands for Grammar of Graphics, and there's an entire book dedicated to that. And we have a different book club all, all oriented for ggplot. The point being is that ggplot isn't your only library for visualization. In fact, there's a huge quantity of different options that you have. In the example that we're discussing with this J4, uh, our JavaScript uh, for R, uh, in this case, we're trying to access a different library that can interact between the RStudio environment and, and the web environment of JavaScript, okay? So I said, technically, uh, there's nothing wrong with a static image using ggplot. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. As long as you convey your intent, your job is done, right? As a developer, or is it? Um, ggplot is only one graphic utility package or service. Certainly it is not the only package. So we're gonna move over to Plotly. Now, the author comments that Plotly has been downloaded from CRAN for uh, in a total number of 4.9 million times at the time of authoring. Now, I didn't look at the date of when this publication was made available, uh, but 4.9 million is not very many as compared to today right now. Uh, I went to the website, this Data Science Meta, which is just a subsidiary. It doesn't directly have any relation to CRAN necessarily, uh, but it is using the API to pull from CRAN. Uh, Plotly as a package has been downloaded 10,129,165 times. Uh, it is currently ranked 179th out of the total list of 18,641 entries. Now, there's a, there's a couple at the very bottom here that are registered as zeros. So I uh, anytime we start throwing uh, numbers at things, I always caution because there's a little fidgeting going on there. You can, you can fudge these numbers a bit. But the fact is that um, 
the comparison between 4.9 million and then now today 10 million, uh, this tells me that the the uh, author uh, when they took that snapshot. Okay. Continuing on. All right. So I am pulling direct code from this book. I want to ensure that I'm citing the material specifically. Uh, this is the JavaScript for R by John Cohen. Uh, this is chapter three and it's figure 3.1 of this chapter. This code snippet is trying to highlight the extreme simplicity of rendering a plotly output. Okay. Now, starting out, uh, so we're calling on the library plotly, but what I wanted to note is this underscore plot underscore ly. So the term plotly is used in multiple languages for our studio specifically. We're going to be using this underscore to instantiate the graphical object. We're using the cars data set, which only has two columns, speed and distance. So we're calling it on the X coordinates for speed and the Y coordinates for distance. We are adding markers. So we'll talk about the add feature in just a second, but that gives us our points along the top and bottoms here. Uh, with this particular data set, I can hover over a single instance of XY coordinate and have it pasted to the screen. I can also zoom into an area, okay? Now you can't do this with ggplot necessarily. I'm not saying that we can't. I'm saying that initially with just the ggplot library, you don't have this ability to do this, right? It is a gra grammar of graphics. It does visualize things, but we don't have any direct interactivity with it unless we add extra features, which there's a wrapper for Plotly and ggplot. Uh, it's ggplotly. Uh, that will be able to wrap this around. Okay. But I'm always very fascinated or amazed at some of the you know, world of open source and, and the ability of saying, yeah, that's a great idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that idea and, and extend it into another avenue continually moving forward. Okay. What this does is it wraps the existing ggplot graphics with a ggplotly, making them interactive. Now you can call direct plotly as a librarian generate a graphical object, yes. Or you can use your familiar ggplot and then wrap it in a plotly um, service, which intend, intentionally makes it uh, interactive. The key differences between ggplot and plotly are number one, ggplot uses the plus sign, whereas uh, to add layers, um, this isn't horrible, but it does lend itself to some semantic hiccups. Uh, we'll call them speed bumps is what I'm always uh, referring to them as, as you're coding um, and you're, you're using a particular semantics. Uh, Russ, if you don't mind me, uh, you and I had a side conversation about some of the details in scripting, um, how you want your, your actual I don't know, text to be displayed, this linter kind of concept. Um, anyway, ggplot always has this plus symbol. And we've, we've talked about this in past experiences where that plus symbol adding layers to it, um, sometimes your brain doesn't want to use the plus symbol and you want to apply it in a different manner. Plotly uh, recognizes the pipe operator from the tidyverse. And this is the package Magritter uh, or Magritter. Uh, people put different syllables in this word, but it's the pipe operator and so Differences between ggplot using the plus sign versus plotly is going to use the pipe for adding elements or adding uh, layers to it. So what this implies is that it kind of follows the standard, current standard of our studio tidyverse by using that form. There is a comment, Russ, if you want to add your, your opinion as well, feel welcome or anybody can add their opinion. Um, the use of the pipe or the use of the uh, Magritter package uh, is an opinionated form of writing syntax. It's not a requirement. You don't have to do this, right? So I don't want anybody to feel pressured to say, well, what is this pipe and how does it work? That's a different discussion. You don't, it's not required. It just is kind of the future of tidyverse sort of authoring semantics, okay? And so the Plotly library does support it and you can use it to add layers. So as an example, I have 
calling on the uh, Magruder package, calling on the pl Plotly library. We are creating or instantiating a graphic object, plot ly. We're using the MT cars data set uh, with our x coordinates being displacement. We're adding markers with the y being miles per gallon and the text as row names, empty cars. Uh, again, passing it over to adding another layer of lines um, with this being fitted. Um, L-O-E-S-S, -S, uh, linear object. Uh, Rust, are you familiar with what that function is? I, I didn't look that up. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. It's, I, it's um, it, oh God, I can't remember now. Um, it's, um, I can look it up real quick if you'd like. Uh, I, I do have our studio still running. I'm it's my... locally weighted smoothing. Okay. Effectively, yeah. Uh, and that's, so this GM, uh, G, uh, smoothing effect, this orange line is based on that uh, additional layer. Um, what I find fascinating about this, and I don't know if anybody else shares in my, in my enthusiasm for uh, interactive graphic objects, but using Plotly, um, you, you immediately right out of the gate have all of these additional features. Again, I'm not deterring from ggplot. ggplot has a huge history and a huge following, and I do not want to uh, um, deter anybody from going down that, that path. I'm in indicating that Plotly as a service um, immediately ties in with some interactive where ggplot is an image, Plotly is giving you that more interactive element. So, all right. You can do this with ggplot. It just takes extra packages and extra code. Yeah. And a, a great thing about these interactive visualizations is that, you know, um, you can you can hand them on to someone who isn't a you know who isn't technical for them to interact with like i i mean i used to make the plotly type images from ggplot so that um the, the scientists i was working for were able to pick out their you know interesting spots on a scatter plot and look at what gene that was and things like that oh, interesting which they wouldn't be able to necessarily do because they don't know r and wouldn't be able to filter and things to, to find them things so yeah i mean the the interactive visualization and particularly because you can set these up such that you can just send an html file to someone or put it on a you know in Dropbox or something like that right. and they can open it in the browser you don't need to set up a server on you know and, and navigate IT at whatever firm or university you're working at sure um it, it's just it, it's so nice to be able to give those kind of things for people to interact with so that they can come up with further questions for your um data science work and, and yep. whatnot yeah. Agreed. And I, I, I was just going to throw in two more cents with uh, the concept of Plotly. If you're not, if you're not involved in the R Studio community, Plotly is not just about R Studio. Plotly is in Julia. Plotly is in Python. Plotly is in, I don't know. There's a data or dash dash language. I, there's an F sharp, and I've never heard of that before. I need to go research what that scripting language is. Um, point being, Plotly as a Service sorry. is uh, available in multiple languages. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, uh, um, F sharps is like a kind of functional language that's is it? related to C sharp. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's quite, I mean, it's quite well known in like the .NET world, but that's that not really would make the world sense. I've ever spent any time in. But, no, uh, that is not my familiarity at all. Uh, the Windows word is the, is the thought that comes to mind there. Uh, moving on to our next subject, we're going to talk about data table, all right, or the DT library, or DT package uh, from, from CRAN. Uh, the DT package provides an R interface to the jQuery uh, JavaScript library data tables. Now, what I don't want to get confused, and I want to make sure that we're very clear on, when I use the definition of DT, meaning data tables, or we use the Java or jQuery or JavaScript uh, statement of data tables. I am not, not, not confusing this with data dot table. 
That's a different subject. Data.table is a completely different thought process, not even related to what we're discussing with this um, DT package. And I wanna make that very clear distinction because I was uh, continually finding um, Google hits. As I was researching this, I, I, I kept typing data.table and I had to force myself to stop uh, and, and, and call it the intended purpose, the intended name of the package. Uh, unique characteristics of data tables versus HTML tables alone are you can paginate. Uh, pagination means that you can, uh, I don't know what it's the word, uh, staging it and then moving to another entry. So you're not, uh, you're being optimal with your, with your display. You don't have to serve, you know, 10,000 rows of information at once. You can paginate through them. Uh, oftentimes you'll see this one through X number. And then as you iterate through, page one, page two, page three, pagination. Uh, instant searching, this is not common in most data tables unless you do a control F or some kind of a fine feature. Um, what this does is automatically give you a search window or a search uh, object on your, what's the word, data table window. It's not an iframe, but it's, it's, it's this object on your HTML page you have this search window immediately available to you. Uh, Multi-column ordering, you can change your columns around. Obviously, when you refresh your page, it's going to go back to the original, but the fact that you can sort things as needed, move things around as needed. Uh, you can use almost any data source. I want to be careful with that statement when I, I'm taking these from the data table web page. Uh, there was an extension to that topic of being able to uh, apply to different data sources. We're talking about where you're getting your information to populate your, your uh, web page. Uh, it is e easily themable. Uh, you can modify it with a cascading style sheet, uh, simple enough. And then there's all the, all, uh, also a wide variety of extensions. These are buttons or, or little um, elements that you can add to your data table and make it even more interactive or if you want to do some additional logic with it. So the example that we have is from our uh, chapter three. Uh, and this is figure 3.4. The importance that the author is conveying and what I'm trying to convey as well is it's one line. It's, it's literally one line of text. Now, what I did notice is I said, well, wait a second, that's not the same cards that I'm familiar with. No, 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 this is a different data set. This only has two columns. If you're familiar with the MT cards, that's like, I don't know, what is it? Eight or 12 columns uh, wide. Uh, this cars data set is not the same thing. It's just two columns and that's it. But we do have our speed variable and our distance. Uh, and then this is just listing it out. So if I wanted more rows, I could apply them. If I wanted more rows, I could. Uh, if I wanted less rows, I could do that. Right? If I wanted to search for, I don't know, the number 25. All right it's only pulling out where the number 25 shows up. And that's this row 25 and for the value of speed in row number 50. All right. Uh, yeah, let me go back. I'm just going to fix the page. There we go. So what I was showing earlier with our bulleted list is the option of pagination. That's this element down here. Um, and for the purposes of our discussion. When I'm talking about the object, it's this point here. I'm, I'm highlighting it, trying to capture the text that is uh, wrapping around this uh, object. Again, it's not an iframe. It's not like it's a separate window by itself. It's just the ability of rendering information in this format. Um, Arthur, if you don't mind me um, putting you on the spot and feel welcome to ignore me if you'd like to. Uh, in our introduction a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned that you're doing a lot of work with data tables. Um, do you use this library often or would you be able to? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I'm more frequently using, or actually uh, only using uh, Reactable or React Table. I'm not sure okay. how it's pronounced. It, yep. it has a lot of the same features as, as DT. Um, I I feel like it's, so I've not, I've not touched on DT in a long time time i think back since i was kind of first tinkering with shiny oh several years ago okay. um but um 
I think like Reactable has a lot more um, scope for, um, how do you call it? Uh, um, tailoring a lot of the UI elements, but I think it may lack, at least in its R form right now, a lot of like the extension libraries that seem to Good exist for, for, for DT. Good point. And, and we'll even talk about crosstalk here in just a second and the future of this interaction widget HTML widget relationship. Um, yes, I would I would definitely support your your comment of of potentially lacking, not in a negative way. It's just it hasn't been developed yet, uh, or the uh, the effort has not been put in to um, make it as widely acceptable in other programming languages uh, that that data table or that Plotly are. Good good statement. Uh, going on. So the next topic is going to be this crosstalk. So what we did a moment ago, chapter one, or sorry, section one was just talking about the HTML widgets and the predecessor of the R charts and that what made into HTML uh, widgets. We went into uh, section number two, which was Plotly as a graphical object. We went into section three, which is the uh, data table element or data table numeric visualization uh, format textual visualization. And then finally, this crosstalk. Now, what is crosstalk? <laughs> um, crosstalk is the ability of being able to allow two widgets to communicate with each other inside this HTML ephemeral space that we're talking about. And it's actually the R6 uh, storage here. In just a second, I'll, I'll explain that. Crosstalk is an add-on. It's an addition to the HTML widgets uh, package providing a cross widget interaction. Technically, specifically, the only thing that these uh, crosstalk package does is allow for linked brushing and filtering. Now, linked brushing is when you highlight something and then it affects another page or another uh, graphical object. The filtering option is literally when you highlight it, it will show you what has been filtered or, or be able to display it. Now, the statement a moment ago, Arthur, thank you for your comments and Russ, your uh, feedback as well we're indicating that crosstalk isn't technically finished yet, or I guess the future of crosstalk is not completely um, uh, generated yet. There's gonna be additional abilities here. Now the, the comment I'm going to uh, state, or I wanna be careful that I'm not opinionated, is it going to be in R? I don't know. Is it gonna be in Python? I don't know. If is it going to be in Julia? Is it gonna be in Ruby on Rails or some other web framework? I have no idea. Right now for our studio, this crosstalk package authored by the uh, developer is only highlighting linked brushing and filtering. Is there futures for it? I would presume yes. Okay. Russ, do you have a thought on there or maybe in your um News. I, to be honest i think what uh, my uh, what i've noticed is that if, if 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 something gets implemented in python say it will be implemented in r pretty soon after um and so um i i suspect if additional kind of um libraries are, are, are created that does this uh thing that 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 um crosstalk can do um i i suspect r will iterate to something more powerful yeah um, yeah well I'm, I'm 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 actually trying to give focus or attention to a comment from the author uh, john cohen uh in our slack channel made a statement that uh we think or him and Tan were going back and forth, and the statement was maybe our studio is holding some cards uh, close near and dear to their heart for their conference release. Again, we don't know what that news is, and I'm not implying that it's going to happen. Uh, I don't want to have a, uh, a uh, you know, what's it, hype that doesn't actually <laughs> come through, right? Um, we're just putting it out there. Keep going, keep going. Um, a couple limitations of using crosstalk. The first one is HTML widgets must be specific, specifically modified or called upon by the author of the HTML page. This is not an automated system and it's not just accessing your namespace NS uh, uh, variable list. 
you have to specifically tell it to do what you're asking it to do. So there are some additional lifting uh, to implement crosstalk. You have to know what you're calling on, okay? The second one is crosstalk currently only works for linked brushing and filtering, again, highlighted previously, uh, that show individual data points, not aggregate or summary views. And that kind of goes back to our spec uh, specificity, if I'm saying that word correctly. Um, you have to explicitly tell crosstalk what you're doing. And then also uh, we cannot do any aggregate or summary views because that doesn't match the data between everything. And then the last one is crosstalk is not appropriate for large data sets. Um, please, if you're trying to, uh, I don't know, render some astronomic uh, sunspots, you know, huge mega gigabit data set, try to not do that in HTML. It's not efficient. It's not managed in the same manner as other forms of, of memory usage. Um, so this is for small data sets, not for large things. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just extend a brief uh, story in relation to large data sets or management in HTML of large data sets. About three, maybe four years ago, I was off on a tangent and I was writing, actually it was, it was graduate st studies. Uh, I wanted to ingest GPS data and plot it using the uh, Google Maps API. Okay. So I, I'm doing all my, my hard work and I, I come up with about 65,000 hits of GPS lat lawn values, et cetera. And I want to put it on this, this Google map. And uh, what, I, what I come to realize or what I come to understand was that um, Google Maps API at the time of this, me trying it, only allowed for 500 entries on your web page. Um, I've got 65,000. So uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board here. I'm laughing about this subject when I read the not for large data sets, what I was dealing with large is a, is a relative term. Um, but if you're limited to 500 and I've got 65,000, that would be considered large. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, DNA, uh, uh, bio something searching. Uh, there's use these large data sets. You don't want to do this in the browser. Uh, try to do something a, a little bit smaller or see if you can draw out what you're trying to convey in a smaller form. Uh, Crosstalk does use the R6 class to wrap existing data frames. That's what makes it available between the um, RStudio and, and the um, HTML JavaScript and this R6 class. Um, I am taking this, uh, yeah, this is from the, the, the Crosstalk web page. Um, uh, I need to make this. I want to just highlight how awesome this is. So what we're talking about when we were discussing brushing, uh, brush linking, when you highlight a particular section of data and then how it is reflected on the other coordinates. Now the, the comment from the author and the comment that was in this uh, crosstalk example page uh, was using a bootstrap columns um, um, function. This is only so that it puts the two columns, or sorry, puts the two tables side by side with each other. Um, it has no direct effect on the uh, shared crosstalk data library. If you go back and look, this shared iris named object, and then we're passing it as a new uh, form, the iris data, uh, iris data set. And that's what allows us the ability of highlighting these different various elements from an XY coordinate system to a YX coordinate system. I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, in the, in the left-hand side, we're talking about pedal width. On the right-hand side, we're talking about uh, sepal length and width. Any thoughts? I just, I, I guess the, the, the element that I find most fascinating with this is the, just the option of being able to highlight on one side and then it draw out uh, the comparative forms on the right-hand side. And it, it works the other way too. It's not that I have to only use the left or the right-hand side. It works on both ends. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really neat. Uh, it's, um, so, but I'm wondering about the, the kind of internals of that. So the, um, when you um, 
when you send data, sorry, when you load your HTML file onto your browser, mm -hmm. presumably the, the data will be stored within that. And I'm guessing that Crosstalk must make like a kind of random identifier or something like that from which the data is pulled into the D3 plots or, or whatever it, it uses. Correct. So, um, right. Ah, well, that's yes, okay. Uh, I think it just must have like a like a key for each row uh, of the data set. So since it's a shared data set, it can just kind of, as you filter on one side, it, it kind of filters on the on the other side, just showing you those observations with that that key. Okay. That's at least that's what I think I gleaned from 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 the chapter. I've not looked at the internals at all. We're not. It's it's not a common like data set that the JavaScript library or the HTML document object model is rendering. Correct. It's 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 more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like like it's not it's not what we would consider a common data set uh, or, or 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 data frame. It's it's. There, it, it, it's processing it in a different format, right? But the format is just this XY coordinate system. Is that how you're implying it, Arthur? Because I think these points are just how it's pasting, excuse me, how it's putting the, the objects on this coordinate. Um, Go to sources. So I think like my this is my my guess. Uh, yeah. My guess is that there is somewhere this this data this data table represented in in JavaScript fashion. So kind of like a okay. you know a series uh, like where each each row would kind of be its own JavaScript ob or JSON like object. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess each one of those rows would have a key. I guess it would just be like a serial number or some other identifier. Okay. Yep. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, when you, when you brush, you're kind of like, you're selecting those elements in the document object model and correct. Well, and, and then that's, that's causing some change on, you know, like on the right hand side of just showing those, those rows, mm -hmm. uh, how the filtering is done. And I guess like the, uh, the result of the filtering, I guess, is the, is the purview of the widget itself. Um, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the link is just through a data set that's stored somewhere behind the scenes and, uh, you know, access, at least accessible to, to JavaScript and then through JavaScript to those widgets. That's, that's my guess. Yes. Well, it, it looked like the, from what you were showing earlier, Ryan, it looked like that was actually the D3 representation of the, like the geoms uh, or kind of like the, the marks or whatever they call it in D3 speak. Uh, Marks, marks, marks. Uh, are you uh, like as you're hovering over the? Yeah, like the the circles and certain colors, etc. And uh... let me go back to. It's uh, we weren't discussing this here, right? It was you. You had like the developer. Uh, the the like, you're inspecting the page, I think, and when you're actually looking at those elements, I think you we could see the data, but not as like data per se. So I think maybe you well, this, expand, expand that, uh, but it looked, it looked like they're the, the actual rows of data were there. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, yeah. But it looks like that's the sort of the way in which it appears on the page rather than the data. It's like the full. Exactly. Data. Yeah. It's not uh, what I was, what I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think we're, I hope we're saying the same thing. The format in which the R6 class is wrapping the data frame or data table and displaying it on the screen and then how the document object model is representing it on the HTML page. The, 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 what I wanna be careful is that this representation of this CX class, excuse me, uh, C is the, is, the, is the object. So CX, this point, CY is this point, class is dot, um, or I don't know what the R element is style radius, maybe for like radius. Yeah, reasons. maybe the 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 size of it, and then the fill is going to be de de dependent on if it's uh, blue, orange, or green uh, is the RGB values that we're we're indicating. I don't think this is our data set, or at least I hope that I'm not. This brushing 
format of what we're doing here when we when we brush, yes, without question, 100% to your benefit. When I highlight a box cell, what is copied or what is captured inside that box, compare that or display that to the other side of this. Um, I don't believe these points are the quote unquote data set, like the XY coordinate values or, yeah. or if we were to go to our studio and actually look at, at the uh, iris data set, the no, yeah, the numeric no, values, yeah, the, yeah. The, the the numeric values of yeah. of what is contained in that data set are not yeah. are not. On the but I, I but I am still I, what I still think though. I mean, in order for in order for these circle values and positions and things to be computed on the browser side. The answer comes from somewhere. Or right? data must be stored in the HTML somewhere or in some allied file or something. Um, it must be stored on the browser side such that those things can be computed. Oh, right. Um, well, in, or the what ability... I'm wondering though is if you is if there is possible data leak worries. Then you know if you've got. Um, if if you're visualizing something and there's like personally identifiable content in your original data frame in R, but all you're doing is presenting height and weight or something like that in your um, um, markdown document, you know, mm -hmm. in the figure, um, is it is it possible to, you know, you might be passing over more columns than you actually intended when you create this um, um, crosstalk possibly uh, object and um, uh, yeah I don't know I mean it's not something I often worry about but like I, I do wonder whether there's mm -hmm. uh, well uh, as an example and I, I Arthur I, I, I hope I'm I'm not uh... I, I, we're not debating. I don't want to. I don't want to intend to debate or rust uh, the input of that container space of where exactly is that information stored. Um, I'll try to find an answer for that and highlight it based on our uh, use of of these HTML widgets. What I was what I was hoping to convey. Uh, Russ made the statement of hidden, possibly hidden data. So right now that um, I'm on the DT uh, data tables.net webpage. And this uh, example uh, of, of data table shown here, if I right click and I inspect this element. Okay, so again, we're just dumping into debug or, or dev, dev tools uh, from a browser's perspective. What I found most fascinating about this is it's not, it is an HTML table. So you do have your TD tags, you do have your uh, uh, TH tags, et cetera. What I found most fascinating is if we expand these points, you will notice that I have a DTR hidden style display none, and then it gives a value to it. Now, Russ, to your benefit, what you just stated is actually what uh, I'm hoping to access here. So we don't have the, the number 162, 700, Textually on our on our display, it's not being shown to the screen until I expand that element, and now we see this salary entry open. This is an important subject in security and in, in what it is that you're containing any API calls. You know, there's no hidden agenda. This is why we want to protect sensitive information so that it isn't available uh, uh, or unintentionally made available. Um, this. This would not be an appropriate way of hiding information from anybody. Um, it's very easy to dump into dev tools uh, on a browser and have access to everything that's being shared between the server and the, and the client. Now, to your benefit, Russ, and to, to Arthur, um, in most web servers, you're going to have this read and execute ability, but not have the ability of writing to the server. Uh, so you're not you're not going to pwn another server uh, with with good security tools. Um, is there other ways that you can access memory space on that server and pwn the computer or pwn the server? Sure. Yes, yes. That's why they they Google pays lots and lots of money, uh, or most large firms pay large sums of money 
especially with these web traffic sort of um, frameworks, uh, where's the vulnerability? How can you access it? How can you take advantage of another computer? I'm going down this security risk concept, but when we use just the topic of JavaScript as a language should automatically have security in the forefront of your thoughts. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's finish our last statement here. So what I wanted to what I wanted to do in this second example of crosstalk, and again, I'm just using the same code. Um, I do want to make sure that users are aware. Um, I had to load the DevTools GitHub version of this package. Uh, I don't know if it was my R Studio or if it was CRAN, but uh, D3 Scatter was giving me problems. So by loading the the GitHub version of it, the DevTools version of it, I was able to uh, get these images to operate. What we have here is a combination of both filtering and also uh, pixel uh, or, or uh, brush brush filtering. First off, you can just literally check box a radio button of four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder. Now, these elements can be anything that's in your data set. So just know you have that ability of filtering with respect to giving one uh, radio button and then ignoring or, or, or not displaying others. The other option is a slider bar. So using a Shiny app, we can move this slider bar, giving us a minimum maximum value of what we want to display. I thought that was kind of neat too. The third option that we have is this automatic, right? Do you have an automatic? Yes or no? And I'm sorry, the zoom back out, it'll probably make it. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure why the rest of that is not being displayed, but the answer is either all, no, or yes. And by selecting that, um, we're going to be limiting um, whether or not we have an automatic transmission or not. So the last and final comment here, zoom back in for the team, is you can still do that, uh, what is it, brush linking uh, from one table to another. Right? So by highlighting different points, we're seeing it uh, being the, uh, having an effect on the other side. The last statement I have here is just the final wrap up section. And I am currently, I don't know how many minutes I've been talking, 55 minutes. So we got about five minutes left. The link that I have is to the HTML widgets page uh, and it's the crosstalk compatible services. This is important. So there are only four compatible widgets at the moment, five, five compatible widgets. We have Plotly, Leaflet, so Leaflet is more of like a mapping service, GIS type mapping service. Think of it as Git, uh, like uh, uh, Google Maps, only in more of an open source engine format, uh, Leaflet. Uh, data table, summary widget, I did not mess with or didn't, didn't open, but I'm assuming it's the same concepts of what we were just doing a moment ago. Uh, and then this RGL, this I didn't even open, but it has to do something with a, uh, 3D rendering engine, and it's based on the OpenGL uh, 3D rendering display. So, Arthur, if you don't mind me highlighting you one more time, uh, your earlier statement about the D3 object, uh, OpenGL, does that, is D3JS or just D3 in general and OpenGL, I think they're related somehow. The, it's not, it, the, the, they're not from the same developer. I need to go look that up myself, so I'm not appearing that I don't know. I just need to go confirm. A lot of the times, uh, 3D rendering engines or, or 3D objects um, use some form of um, graphical access, uh, uh, graphical library access. So that's all I've got. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, it's an interesting chapter. While I was working through it, I um I was having a look at the source code for things like Plotly and and DT to see what the commonalities were. As you know, um. So in each of them, there's like a there's a a point in the the code where the HTML widgets 
um, gets cold. And um, so I was having a look at that and the reactable and um, and DT. So sorry, the create widget function get called. Now we'll be talking about um, that function, how to use it and things in the next couple of chapters in a bit more detail. But it, it was quite interesting to see that, that there isn't there isn't a great many um, kind of parameters and things like that in order to wrap up one of these um, JavaScript libraries. So in a in a typical package, so what we're looking at at the moment, the um, the the Plotly package. So in the inst, inst directory, there's a, a copy of Plotly.js, and then in the plotly.r kind of function there's a as widget function that wraps up whatever plot you've made um using create widget um and yeah i mean it looks quite it looks quite straightforward and i look forward to tripping up <laughs> over the next coming weeks because things that look uh, straightforward typically have a lot of stuff going on under the hood. Um, Has certainly, certainly like the reactable one seemed to have to set up quite a lot of additional code, presumably because it's using React rather than kind of vanilla JavaScript. Um, but the actual call to create widget was is, is quite, qu quite simple, I guess. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's neat. I I was wondering though whether I mean I know that the crosstalk says that it's not for big data sets, but I, I was wondering whether this the whole of interactive visualization all seems pretty um, memory heavy and and things and probably Correct. shouldn't be used with um, really big. Well, certainly with you know plots that represent tens hundreds of thousands of points I'll, um, I'll give a i'll give a good example of the concept of rendering and just chugging along and i don't my my opinion does not in, uh, in, in intend or or convey a lack of use or or a recommended lack of use i ran into a huge brick wall with the uh, world uh world bank uh, open open data set i think or open world bank there's a there's a link that i'll send you but russ i i shared this example in another book club if you try to render anything from that world bank data set it will almost completely lock your computer and you'll have to wait for 10 minutes before the page finally paints and i know i know i know it's because it's uh manipulating that data set in your browser it's it's accessing your gpu or your your computer to to, to pull the information in and, and process whatever it is you're asking for but it is not speedy and I, I i don't that my my opinion may be that i'm i don't think it's chrome i don't think it's internet explorer i don't think it's the actual document object model rendering component that's causing the slowness um, it's definitely not from the computers it does it on multiple machines um, you don't need a supercomputer to access World Data Bank, but um, the statement is to your comment, Russ, of large data sets. Um, as developers, we have to be cautious or uh, familiar that we can't expect somebody that's ask, accessing this with their phone, with a Raspberry Pi, with a tablet versus a supercomputer may not have the same capabilities. Um, and that's, that's just a, a thought that I have in the back of my mind whenever I'm trying to work with some of these services. Nothing gives me more frustration to, um, <laughs> I'm not using the, the, the right library when things just lock up and grind to a halt. Um, <laughs> that tells me I'm heading down the wrong direction. But yeah, there's nothing like slow feedback to right. frustrate. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we'll probably try and wrap up now if that's okay um lucio do you have anything you'd like to uh, say i mean are, are, have you done much with any of these packages that were mentioned today with dt or with plotly
and yes, I have worked with mainly with RGL, DT, and Plotly, and I didn't know about close talk, so I think that, could, that it would be very beneficial because I have only worked with those widgets separately, separately. So I, I have some new ideas for some projects now that I can communicate with, between them. Cool. Right. Um, yes, so next I have a, Actually, Russ, if you don't mind, I have one kind of quick question, which maybe we'll, we'll answer outside of this, but I'll uh, pose a question now, I guess all the same is, if anyone knows if there's actually an up-to-date kind of compendium of what works with crosstalk, because actually, as, as, as Ryan was, uh, um, as Ryan was talking, I, I noticed like Reactable actually works with crosstalk. In fact, they have a couple examples in their documentation that use crosstalk, and yet the you know the, the crosstalk page doesn't have that on there yet. I mean, maybe it's just a matter of you know the workflow is find the library that looks nice. Does it work with crosstalk? If yes, proceed. If no, look for another library. But uh, I, I was thinking that there's got to be some compendium somewhere of you know everything that works with crosstalk as of today. I that's like a common common language thing, right? Uh, or, or being able to share the same uh, stored element. Uh, the, the thought of services that communicate with each other that are outside the uh, user space of relevance, knowing that they actually communicate with each other. It's like you're, you're accessing this common protocol, right? If that's HTML5, if that is, you know, JavaScript, ECMA version, whatever they're at right now. Right, it's these protocols, and and if those libraries are using the same protocol, then there should be no reason they can't communicate with each other because you're on that same common playing field. Um, I'll try to find something for you, Arthur. That's a really great question. I, I appreciate that even thought process into that. If 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 the particular crosstalk. CRAN page or, or our studio oriented page is saying, here's the only five libraries that we have, but there's some other access that says, hey, I got all this other JavaScript libraries that can use crosstalk as well. We should probably promote that or, or attempt yeah, to promote yeah. it. Lou, it does actually say on the crosstalk page that if you find anything that does use it, that is compatible with it uh, to make a pull request to crosstalk as uh, documentation and um, because obviously, I, I, presumably, the developer can't know everything. Um, but yeah, the, it, certainly, if Reactable is use, is is compatible with it, there'll probably be many others that are um, following in its path. Um, yeah. Cool. Right. Um, okay. So next week we're doing chapter four. Um, no one's offered yet, so I might put my name in for that one, uh, if that's okay. Um, and so the title, oh, sorry, what is it now? The title is, is it your first widget or is it, no? It is the basics of building widgets. So we'll look a little bit more under the hood at how to use the functions from HTML widgets. Hopefully um, look a, a little bit into how to make your own um, usable widget and things. But I think there's bigger examples in future chapters, but yeah. Um, yes, this was really interesting. For a very short chapter, we talked for a long time, but I quite like, I quite like that, to be honest, because it, it gives you more of a chance to talk about how it fits into what you yourself want to do with R and, and, and things like that. And um, yeah. Great. Thanks everyone for coming along and I'll hopefully see you all next week. If any of you do want to volunteer to do a, a subsequent chapter um, and there's, you know, there's some substantial chapters coming up, um, there's a sign up document in the Slack channel and yeah, feel free to put your names down. It would be really good to have a few more uh, people contributing as well. Cool. Good. I'll uh, see you all next week. Thanks, uh, Ryan. That was great. You bet. Have Thanks. a good day. Have a great week.